on my right we have the mighty <laughs> Puleta Upubong um, who is part of our ladder shoots team on the capital side it's also a very veneered um, art collector They're one of the best we have um, then we have <laughs> My new friend, <laughs> my best friend, um, Caroline Waterhouse from R&B. Um, she's been so generous and devoted throughout this entire process. Um, yeah, calling me out for all kinds of things, for not having labels and artwork. Um, and then you have Rula, um, who I just met IRL today. Um, yeah, he's uh, the director of the Social Impact Prize. And today we'll be chopping it up about a very important topic, especially in the context of this art fair. Um, you know, the idea of change makers and rule breakers, for me, I don't think of it as, a, as something radical. I think of it as something more sincere. You know, uh, the sincerity in breaking rules because at least you're able to show your face while doing it. You know, it's not deceptive. <laughs> you know the truth when someone breaks a rule. You know where they stand. Um, and I think these three people here are the perfect people to, to sort of uh, break it down for us. So I'll start off with the first question. Um, and I will, I will give this one to Rulof to start us off. Um, Rulof. Can you share an example of an African artist whose work challenges traditional artistic conventions and has had a significant impact on the art scene? I can't. Um, I you can't. can't. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I want to unpack that a little bit first. Cool. Because I think all artists are rule breakers. Otherwise you wouldn't make art. You'll be in finance. Or, <laughs> uh, sorry. Oh, going to be an accountant. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> or um, something. So I think that's really important that all artists are always busy breaking rules, be it their own rules, be it the medium that they work through or the subject that they're working in. I think that's important. And I think that gets you out of bed as an artist. Is that today, you're going to do something unique and something different. I think artists that we are actually referencing in this talk aren't at this fair. If you are a change maker and a rule breaker artist, right now we don't know who you are. We don't know what you're doing. And neither should you. You should be trying out things, you should be experimenting, you should be on the margins, not in the center, trying out stuff that breaks, that's got to do with AI, that's got to do with all kinds of things that we in this room at this fair can't recognize. It's important for me to just kind of state this before we mention artists, which I can do, but that also starts bringing them into the center, right? Yeah. I think change makers is a big term, and I think there are people like Leslie Loco, some people recognize the name, who is somebody on a level as a black, Canadian Scottish woman who's changing the world at a level where rule breakers can see themselves participate. Why do I say that? She's the first black woman curator of the Venice Architecture Biennale. That's a change maker. She did it here and then she scaled it up and took it to Venice. So that's, I'm starting to answer your question a little bit by framing it first. Within that frame, we can say Sumaya Valley, who I think as some people would recognize already, Joburg architect, Serpentine Gallery, youngest ever artist, a youngest ever architect. But her practice is not about building, it's about not building. She's also at Venice, so do yourself a favor and go look at the 89 projects at the Venice Architecture Biennale. And here's the thing, half of those are African artists and architects, half. I think that's power. Half of those are women in architecture. 
Now that changes the world, that breaks the rules. And that's just one person. So under that, there's a lot of people that participate in it. You know, there's lots of African artists and architects that do that. But I invite you to not just look in this room, in this fair, art in the world, but also go and look at these other spaces. That's where you find the change makers and rule breakers. They're in between disciplines, between art and architecture, between poetry and science, between technology, AI, and painting. That's where we find the new rule breakers. Okay. Amazing. Thank you for that answer. I think, um, you know, there's a transdisciplinary turn, you know, where mediums like architecture, like, you know, Sumaya Valley has an artistic practice, you know, that sort of converges with her architectural practice, with her curatorial practice. And I think maybe that's a product of, you know, the millennial uh, multi-hyphenate sort of character, you know. Um, personally, I've been an artist for 10 years, and then five years ago, I became a curator, you know, and then now I'm doing production management. But, you know, it's sort of like you, we pick up skills, like, as we go, and those converge to create something new, you know, and I, and I find that interesting in the people that you just mentioned now. Um, Julia, I have a question for you. How... Uh, can institutions, organizations, collectors um, incentivize and facilitate uh, and encourage uh, artists to be change makers and rule breakers? Do you think, do you think, I mean, that's the first half of the question, but do you think it's awarded in, in, in the African context? Sure. Well, I'll link it to the first question because I think it ties up well on how an artist changed me to answer your question. And I think, you know, to piggyback where, where you started, um, so I started collecting accidentally in 2007. It was a random mentor that said, stop using your bonuses on ridiculous thing and invest in art. And I then started consciously collecting in 2010. I then came across an artist in Nigeria in 2017, and he asked me, so what do you do? And I said, ah, I work with startups, and I also collect African arts, and I really was passionate about why I'm so excited about African art. And he said, I think the term African art is lazy and limiting. And I was just like, yo, <laughs> like, you know, this is what, <laughs> there I am, pretty chopped as a collector, and he, he called it up. He was like, we are... 54 countries, over 2,000 tribes, languages, however you want to word it, and we can do better than call it African art. And his name is Dennis Osadebe in Nigeria, and he's continued to push me and challenge the norm. You know, he was one of the first artists I know that incorporated augmented reality in his work. So he has a, a piece that's called Stand Up, and it's basically a figure with the mask of one of the Yoruba tribes in Nigeria holding his hand over his art, and you watch it through your phone. So wherever, wherever you are, you can view the art piece. And his whole thing is that often we're told to think out of the box or in the box, and he's like, there should be no box at all. So as a result, coming back to the question, what it's done for me is that it's challenged me what I should be doing as a collector, as what I do with institutions, and it's not just about buying art. I think one of the things we can do as collectors and institutions is be champions in more ways than just physically buying the art. Um, personally, I focus a lot about the entrepreneurship side of art. You are, I consider artists entrepreneurs, and how do we make them flourish and become millionaires in their practice? And that's 95% of my focus when it comes to focusing on art. So I owe that to Dennis and many of the artists that I've encountered today but it was challenging me in how I collect and as a result in how I, pro I approach supporting artists. Amazing. Um, yeah, you, you just brought up an artist using AR. Um, and I think, you know, there's a saying that says, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed, you know? And, and we don't see a lot of artists like really get access to, to, to that information, you know, how to work with AR, how to work with XR. 
when it's it's so au courant. Some people would even say that it's old school, you know, because now we're having uh, we're having powerful uh, artificial intelligence engines, you know, that are capable of of even making movies now, right? Uh, entire industries are being undone. Like script writers are protesting because you know you could just prompt a machine to 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 give you a script you know and i think to see artists you know roll with the punches you know and adapt to these new technologies is very encouraging and to find collectors actually that engage with that kind of work you know like in south africa you don't find a lot of video artists you know i ask people like how often do you go to a gallery and uh, see a video art piece you know, and last year someone was like, there's only one video art collector that I know, you know. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, you know, I think of, of collecting um, as a practice, you know, the same way an artist has a practice, the same way a curator has a practice. And I think what would make uh, uh, the world of collecting more dynamic is actually if there was workshops for collecting, because people think it's just something you can just pick up you know, whereas you could build a wonderful collection with a story behind it. I think your collection is, is, is one of those, you know, that you just told a story now and the artist like at the Fotabela, you know, that you that you groomed so wonderfully, you know. <laughs> like it's that's horrible work. <laughs> um yeah, so so I get what you're saying, Caroline. I'm gonna ask you the same question because you know, in, in South Africa, there's not a lot of governmental support, like, for, for the artists. You know, a, a couple of months ago, we wanted to build a 20 million rand flag that glows in the dark. And, <laughs> you know, you see JAG falling apart, which is a public institution that, that used to have its, its, its glory days, you know, that holds one of the most important collections, af actually, on, on the continent. Um, and to see an organization like r &B, you know, from back in the day with R&B talent unlocked and, you know, like the progress that you guys have made in supporting um, institutions, artists and organizations. Um, what, is the, what is the premise for that? And what is the importance actually of... I'll take it back a couple of steps. And that is, you know, you referred to architecture quite a few times. And it's quite interesting that so many of these folk we're probably trained architects who are used to capturing the spirit of the time or, co you know, in concrete or whatever, whatever medium they work in. But I would sort of argue that constraints feed creativity. Constraints are fuel for, crea for creativity. So if you liken change makers to folk who are creative and you don't restrict creativity to any of the art forms, um, as far as I'm concerned, there's an enormous dignity that's now being recognized. And, and it went up dramatically, you know, over COVID as well. So you say, why does, you know, R&B, what we respect as a talent brand, we know that there are people who are, you know, are very happy to do the ordinary and, and, and most people we, en masse love to be led. They even love to be misled as long as someone tells them what to do. And then fortunately, we've got people who want to, who look at a much bigger picture. And, and that's where I think our salvation to some extent lies. And what I love about the arts, and I'm not directly answering your question, but um, that would be too compliant for starters. <laughs> but what I, what I love about the arts, aside from the fact that it challenges everything, is it's not edited. So, you know, you look at, we've just, so R&B does things like stand alongside the head and the low three years ago. And I, there weren't many brands in South Africa who were really keen to dial back to World War I and what happened in Africa. And well, as far as I'm concerned, history is a place of, and this is somebody else's quote, who in, in fact a lady who works with, uh, with us in R&B, Linda Kuching Pasizia. And long story short, is she turned around to me in a particular thing, and she said, you know, from my point of view, history is a place of reference, not residence. And when we were offered the opportunity to do the head and the load, um, understanding it could ignite all sorts of other things, that was, it was like, Linda, you know, you're absolutely right, but if you don't have the reference, you know, how do you, how do you do things differently going forward? So I'm going off the question, but I do believe that, um, you know, talent, you get talented, I mean, I don't think everyone gets everything, and I don't think anyone gets nothing, 
And you can live in extraordinary, I don't have artistic or musical talent. However, we do Starlight Classics and being seen by sort of over 400,000 people now, over 20 years. We, this fair was a case of doing something differently. It's very easy to have something in Santon. You're guaranteed an audience. The whole idea was to take, you know, first of all, Shepston Gardens is an extraordinary property, and to actually take a fair to closer to where the, a lot of the artists are located and their studios, and hence the Open Studios link. And of course, the folk at R&B, they're the believers and then the non-believers, and said, well, what about parking? You know, where, where are people going to park their cars? And I said, well, Uber, when I last checked, there were a few competitors as well. And then, and, and you shouldn't really be driving if you've had a glass of wine. And I don't know anyone at R&B who, who won't have a glass of wine. Um, so, you know, and, and, we, and of course we had a few sleepless nights. And then we, you know, we, we, we found ways around it. Lexus came up with 10 cars. Um, you know, we've got a, a fleet of buses and some extraordinary drivers who are better at building relationships than some of our bankers. So, you know, the driver, and, and all, and we've, you know, it was sold out every night. I mean, it sold out, we, we didn't, it's hard to believe, you know, tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday. I, I was coming and said, do you mind if my husband joins us on Sunday? You know, I don't know if we've got tickets. So, so I think it's, you know, it's talent is one thing. It's people who've got other things. You might have, have money. You might have an understanding of the way business operates. So the art of business can reach out to the business of the arts. Take what you have got and make sure that you, you know, you, 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 Code you, you sort of JV, is a banking term, with somebody who's got something you haven't. I'll give you a little example of Joshua Bell's first extraordinary violin. Violin. It was a syndicate of businessmen who bought him an Amati or a Stradivarius. He couldn't afford it, and they couldn't play the violin. So they followed him around the world, effectively watching their violin being played. And that's a wonderful way. It's the same as you have supported so many artists, you continue to do it. The excitement and the joy that goes into that is, 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 is they can't do without you to begin with. They've got particular talent you recognize. And, and to be honest, I don't think I could do without the music and the arts. But just to go back to the change makers, you know, I could, I could bore you and I'm not going to in terms of constraints of a corporate. And all I do know is, is maybe I'd be bloody minded enough. I'm a 62 now and they sort of keep me around for the moment. Um, and I, I pretty much say, we're going to do this, we're going to do the head and the load, we're going to do war horse, and if it doesn't work, I'll buy out, uh, buy me. I've said that for many years, and there are a lot of people now who love something not to work. <laughs> Please let it not work. And, and Latitudes is another example where we, we joined up with change makers, and, and we hopefully have, the whole idea was a new art experience. We only called it an art fair because we were a little worried that people wouldn't recognize what a new art experience was. But actually, that was the idea, was a new art experience. Amazing. Yeah, I think, I think you know, for me, one of the selling points where I took on, you know, the job as special projects curator is really because of the space. You know, when, when I was shown Shepstone Gardens, um, I, a lot of people would have turned, like a lot of people were like, why would you do that? Like it's a, it's a wedding venue. And I was like, no, it's not, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a property. And, and curation, really what makes curation interesting is presenting new modes of display. You know, the challenge of getting a venue that doesn't have walls, that's covered in marble and covered in sandstone. You can't drill into the walls. Um, you know, it's still in construction. All of those things, for me, made it fertile ground um, for people to imagine a new way uh, that an art fair can be. You know, like an art fair doesn't have to be one thing, you know. And for many, many years, we've had like a, the same model, you know, and creating new models, creating new experiences just create scaffolding for more people to think about creative ideas and how to, to create better experiences for art. You know, like art and space are, are you know, if you, pull up, if you pull a hose pipe into a gallery, it becomes something different. You know, people start reading it as something different. So for curation, space becomes so critical. You know, where you're putting this art, where you're curating it, how people uh, navigate that space, how they interact with each other, um, the potential for the joy of discovery, you know, which is something that's so important to me. 
Um, and I think, you know, in Cape Town, I used to complain a lot because I was like, oh my God, every exhibition is the same artists. You know, I never see new artists, you know. So the second part was Latitudes is like a rule breaker in the sense that one, um, it's founded by women, right? It hosts the Anna Award annually, which awards like women artists. You know, I was at the, I was at the Albertinum in Dresden uh, Albertinum is, is a wonderful museum. It has the biggest Wolfgang Tillman's collection on the planet. They have a whole chamber dedicated to him. And I kept looking for people that look like me in the museum, and there was none. You know, and there was none, like zero. You know, uh, there was one Kahinda Wiley, obviously. Um, but, but that made the absence of all the, the other people, like, so, so, um, so potent. You know, um, so when Latitudes won, you know, started, I saw Latitudes supporting women artists to um, this art fair and the proposal to actually, to actually ask me, how can we carry our values into this art fair? And one of those values is supporting independent artists, you know, and I remember being so bitter a couple of years ago, every time I'd go to an art fair, I'd be like, I'm an artist too, but... I can't get in here, like, how do I get in, you know? And I spoke to one gallerist and he was like, call me when you're 32. I was like, mate, I'm 25. I'm gonna starve the next couple of years, you know? <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, it was very interesting for me to be like, let's start a platform, you know, called Index. You know, Index is, uh, we have the index finger that helps you point at stuff, you know? And Index is something that makes it easy for you to find information, you know? And I was like, I'm interested in databases, you know, in actually giving access to people. And INDEX, which means it's, it's an acronym for independent exhibition, is a platform for independent artists at an art fair. And I don't know any other art fair that has done something like this, you know. So the, the, the idea of change makers, I think, like it sort of starts at home. You know, they say charity starts at home, you know. And I think we can, um, with this, I think we've, we've opened up a door you know, for young artists to come and flourish and have their work be seen in spaces that are so exclusionary. Can, can um, I just add a point on that? So, so one of the things I've always struggled with as a person who's collecting art is where do I go to experience the art in spaces? And you're 100% correct. What Latitude has done here yeah, is phenomenal. But often, specifically as a black person, when you walk into museums, you look at a certain way, you are treated a different way. And I think what I'm excited about, talk about change makers and rule breakers, is artists also pushing the norms about where should they art be. Because there's so many people who are not in this room that want to experience what we're all experiencing. And I think, you know, it's great to have museums, it's great to have fairs, it's great to have great spaces, but it also limits who gets to see the art, even you know, across world norms. And I think too often we might wait for institutions to enable us to do that, but I think collectors, artists themselves, like again, sorry to reference Lagos, I just spent a lot of time in Lagos. There's this water village that's next to Mainland Bridge. And Mainland Bridge is almost like, it's, it's two economies. Like you've got the actual mainland where people earn hardly anything, and on that side, you've got all the fancy hotels, the guys who are arriving, Lamborghinis and packed potholes. And in between, you've got this kind of huts that are built on the water. And this artist insisted to the gallery that I want my exhibition there. People must figure out how they're going to get there. And if they really like my art, they must come there. And I, I, that's like one thing I'm hoping we get to see, that this conversation initiates of... Where do we experience art? How do we access it more regularly? How do we be more accessible for everyone out there? And I challenge artists, I challenge myself, I challenge institutions. Let's do it. 100%. Can I add on to what Pule said and, and with Lucy and Roberta? So, you know, if you think of, of the, the psychology of abundance of what you have got rather than what you haven't, COVID came, latitudes went online. So that, of course, made it so accessible. And independent artists could sell their art on latitude. So, you know, we can sit here glibly as a corporate. Yes, of course, we support the idea and that collaboration is better with all of us. But there was already, there was already a plan. And the plan was, you know, to deliver art anywhere in the world. 
and, and they said art from Africa, not African art. So they didn't uh, limit that description. Um, and yeah, I just don't want it to be misunderstood. You know, we're, we're a collaborator. We love being part of this. It's been a joyous journey and it's only just begun. But there was already a vision with Lucy and Roberta through Latitudes and they went through tough times. And a scarcity mindset would have, would have focused on what they haven't got. And I do believe that a change maker's mindset starts with, okay, so what is there? You know, and, and again, you go back to constraints. A very excited change maker. But over to you. You can't be any of those if you don't take risks. If you're institutional, if you're a collector collecting really weird shit, you have to take chances. Um, in one of the projects, which is the Social Impact Art Prize program that I work and direct, it was a museum that was known for um, art from the previous century. It's more known as a museum where art goes to um, rest. So how do you reinvigorate that thing? How do you turn that into something that breaks a few rules and change itself? So it's an internal process that you can go through if you're an institution or if you're an artist. And in that project, we said, how can we change this form of the art prize? How can we, first, how can we change that? How can we make 10 projects win? In fact, not win, but just give them money to do their work. How can we push that as a different way of doing? And secondly, how can we not make artists compete with each other? That's bullshit. This is not the Olympics, right? And just thinking about it in that way where we're saying artists are collaborators, we are co-creators. Can we make an art prize that awards that kind of work? And can, are, there any, are there enough projects like that? Are there enough practices in South Africa to do that? So in the last round of the art prize, there were 460 projects. Count how many artworks are in this precinct at this fair. Probably the same number. These are projects and art practices who all think that they are working with climate change. I'm going to get to that point. We are overthinking, is it abstract art or is it figuration? As artists who want to work as rule breakers, we have to think about climate change. We have to work with nature, we have to work with the environment, and there, shift and make a change. I said to a friend yesterday, who has kids who are five years old, I said, do you know that your kids will be alive in 2100? That's when the planet's burning. Think about that. And even if you're an artist and you have a voice and it's your artwork or whatever it is you do, that has to change the way we think about the world. So your subject, the reason why you make art can also be rule breaking. And to your point earlier, I, I joke when I say think inside the box. It's important because if you don't have rules to push against, you cannot be creative. Blue sky and thinking outside the box are marketing terms which advertising agencies like to use. But I think having constraints, and I don't mean not money, you can have money. I mean creative constraints is incredibly important in order to break out of those and force you to think differently about the world. 100%. Um, you know, like my, my biggest issue over the past couple of years, my mom always says to me, you're an artist in Europe, you're a curator in South Africa. And that's because I'm a performance artist and I make video art. And I was so broke for so many years, you know, like just because I was so stubborn and that's all I wanted to do. Um, do you guys think there's a future uh, for what I call outsider mediums, right? So because South Africa, a lot of people complain that South Africa is more of an art market than an art ecology. You know, that it's, it's hyper-focused on the commercial impact that an artist can have. And I think that has also trickled down to artists. You see artists charging premium prices, you know, for their work when they, when they barely have a career. You know, and I think, you know, as above, so below. I don't think it's the artist's fault. It's just that there's a closed door. And if somebody is sustaining themselves and paying their rent, paying university or, or what, what they may, you know, they need to make money, you know? Um, so you see a lot of artists, one, going through struggles of aesthetic acculturation. Oh, this style is selling, so I'm going to start making work in this style, you know? Or 
this artist is trending, let me see if I can take a couple of elements from them. Um, do you think in the future there's any incentive, you know, for artists who who are doing what they're doing, you know, without without forcing themselves like into this mold that, you know, is so hyper focused on 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 commercial rewards. So I think outside mediums, to answer your question, is going to be one of the greatest equalizers. Um, so. I'm a significant NFT collector. Um, Non-fungible tokens, the digital art that was here. I've been collecting NFTs for about four years. And for me, the beauty of it is being able, so there's business to business and there's business to customer. Again, thinking about the entrepreneurship angle to art. And often for an artist to get their work to a buyer, there's a lot of layers in between. <laughs> a lot of layers, layers, whether, you know, how you market it, the log logistics part of it, the what you need to buy, and having seen artists in the most remote places be able to sell their digital content to one of their best collectors globally, and it happened instantly, and it to be authenticated instantly, uh, for the royalties to be programmed into that, for the currency risk to be taken away from that, I think we, we only see a fraction of what's yet to come. And given that our continent is the heart of creativity, those who are exposed to that, if we can show artists that it's actually pretty easy to do that, there's a universe of buyers. And I don't think we need as many people in between to get the art from the creator to the buyer. So I'm excited about other mediums, specifically digital, and I think this continent can play a big role. Uh, we already have numerous creators that are in the top 10 globally on this continent. Like there's a lady here, Litabo Huma, who's based in global yes. Victoria, kicking ass, like highly, highly rated in the NFT world, Osinachi out of Lagos, uh, Another artist we all know is going to create NFT soon, so I can't talk about it, but it's happening, you know, and I think, I really think it's going to be the greatest equalizer. I think it's going to, it's going to show what we have in a much faster, imminent way. 100%. Um, Caroline, do you guys have plans to help the outsider artists uh, beyond this, beyond this fair? Also, to your question, Yon, does R&B understand NFTs? Yes, I must put you in, such, in touch with somebody. <laughs> and that is the passion, and it's absolutely something we support. Um, but what I also say is, you, you mentioned South Africa, and, I, and, I, and, and when Pule said, you know, we're a continent where our calling card is creativity. And again, maybe it's because, you know, the socioeconomic, political, um, sort of, we can't call it excitement, but the complexity. And maybe that's what feeds some of the creativity. And then your wonderful, you know, the, 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 so many cultures, etc. So um, the answer is yes to your question. And um, the other, just mentioning, you mentioned rules. And one of my first experiences at R&B in particular, and I'm not punting that, but we have had a book of rules, and it had a value statement in the front, and the whole thing is empty. So really, you know, if you've got values, you don't need rules. I mean, we know that, that, that you need rules for change makers to break them and to find shorter cuts and I think often change makers have got a lovely sort of a uh, usefully lazy streak because they're not going to go the long way around. So they often say that people who are extraordinarily creative can be ever so slightly lazy because they say, how do I get an outcome in a much smarter way? So Conan was my client back in 20, 2005 and that very same book she showed me. So we don't have any rules except it's an A4 page and it has edges four ways around, and that's that's the boundaries. Yeah, I'm joking, but it's also true. <laughs> um, the art gallery should not be the final destination of an artist's career. And if you're only thinking that that's why you're making art, and that's the purpose of everything, you're going to be tired by the end of the day. You need to make art because you're driven. You need to circulate those ideas and the art you make through the world, and one way is a gallery. Another is your studio, another is your mom's house, and any place where you can put that work out and show it to the world and to the public. 
motivating people to give you money in exchange for it is a sales job. Separate those things and you have purpose again. It's really important because if sales is your purpose, then you're just a producer. You're just making consumer goods that you're trying to sell. Separate those things. I mean, I'm only interested in the outsider artist because the outsider eventually doesn't come to the center. The center goes to the margin. It's proven in history over 500 years. Make weird shit. Make difficult stuff. Make stuff that Pula goes, what the fuck is this? But he has the money anyway, I go find it. Make weird stuff, because that's how you stand out. It's a competitive market. Let's talk marketing. You know, you're, you're, you're the producer, you're the strategist, you're the salesperson, and you're the marketer of your work. That's what artists do. They have many skills. They don't just do one thing. And I think that is fantastic, because that's how we survive in yoga, because we're hustlers. Right? It's a yoga thing. Maybe not in the banking world. You don't want your <laughs> bank to be hustling. That way they're not teasing her. R&B uh, had built, we started to build when COVID started, another, another building, and nice lots of shops to let. And of course, there was no one wanting, you know, retail took a real thumping. And uh, so when we came back to work, um, we had all these shops and, you know, very sort of industrial and basically unfinished. And they sort of, and then we were called by the property company, said, you know, we want to put some nice um, posters on the wall saying, too lit. Uh, could you sort of give us a design? And I said, why don't we rather put a gallery, why don't we just put some art in here? And they said, well, what, we, we really don't want to spend more money on finishes. And I said, no, we're not going to be looking at the finishes, we're looking at the art. Anyway, kind of long story short, um, now we have a, a gallery. They've decided not to let it to shops, and we are going to get slightly better finishes. But what was a pop-up and what was a pretty dismal unlit space has now become an extraordinarily funky gallery where in probably the most used space in the building for events. I'm really excited to hear that you're um, paying artists a monthly retainer to put their art in your space. <laughs> and that's a great position to be in. But I think this relationship between the center and the margin, between commerce and institutions and artists, is something we should nurture. I don't think it should be telling you what to do, even if they're the main sponsor. Um, I think it's a relationship. And it goes both ways. You know, so. That's peacemaking. Hundred percent goes to the artists, right? <laughs> actually, actually, let's take you up on that. Absolutely, yes, in our case, because we're not a gallery. So we said we're not paying rent for a gallery. hundred percent to the artist. Win-win. Amazing. Thanks, man. <laughs>